Hello, I'm Craig and welcome to another episode of Football Kit Memories, the football podcast that gets under the shirt. In today's episode, I'm joined by Belfast-born comedian Vittorio Angelone. During the show, I find out how Vittorio got started in comedy and we discuss the evolving methods of discovery and ways of building a fan base that are now open to comedians, including the smart use of social media and podcasting. We talk touring, Edinburgh shows and his upcoming special which will be out in September 2023. Later, and as always, Vittorio picks out three football shirts that represent his relationship with the sport, including shirts from Liverpool, Celtic, and of course, the clues in his name, Italia. Remember, you can listen to this and other episodes of Football Kit Memories on all major audio platforms, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Please do subscribe and share, but above all, please do enjoy the podcast. Okay, so today on the podcast, I'm joined by Belfast-born comedian Vittorio Angelone. How you doing, mate? I'm good. Such a solid pronunciation of my name that I don't even do. That was so impressive. Grazie mille. Parlo un pochino di italiano, actually. So, mm, like, that's yeah. so embarrassing that you speak so much more Italian than I do. You don't speak Italian, no? <laughs> no. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I did a year in class, so I'm all right. I can hold a bit of a conversation until it gets too quick, you know. That's so solid. Fair mm-hmm. play. Thanks very much. So, uh, Vittorio, you grew up in Belfast. Um, I just wanted to ask, like, to kick off, how did you get started in comedy? Uh, well, I used to be a classical musician. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, for my sins. And then um, uh, the... It was a strange experience. I lo- I really liked it. I liked playing in orchestras and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, but what I realized is that I wasn't ever going to watch orchestras. I was never paying for a ticket to see an orchestra unless it was like a friend who I was like obliged to go see or just wanted to hang out after or like I enjoyed seeing friends do stuff. But yeah. um, it wasn't something I had a real urge to do. But I was going to watch quite a lot of comedy like before I left for London I would watch at places like Lavery's Comedy Club in Belfast and I went right. to Angel Comedy Club in London which is brilliant yeah because uh, a lot of the nights of the week you can get in for free and they just have a bucket at the end which is very handy for being a student yeah and I I sort of have the thought of well if I want to be a performer I, it would make sense to do the thing that I would want, want to go and see mm-hmm. Um, so I thought I'll give stand-up comedy a go and I didn't know any better I didn't know that it was supposed to be like difficult i think that's kind of a uh naivety and obliviousness is kind of a superpower at the start of doing things yeah yeah because it's if you think something's supposed to be difficult if you know it's supposed to be difficult then you've put a lot of barriers up for yourself right anyway so i just i was working in the students union at the time and i said oh can we make one of the freshers events a comedy night okay and they were like yes sweet who should we get and i was like well i'll host it right okay which is insane <laughs> to do your first gig to 200 people who a lot of whom you like know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I just hosted it. And uh, a friend, Josh James, who's now a friend who I'd, I'd seen beat King Gong at the comedy store, which is like a big competition thing. Right. Um, I saw him win that and was like, well, I'll just message him on Facebook. And then a friend called Serafina did a set and then a brilliant comedian and improviser and freestyle rapper called the band, the man or Rob Broderick to give him his actual name. Okay. Um, he headlined and it was just amazing. Like it was so good. And I was kind of drunk and I didn't, I probably didn't do very well, but in my head it was good enough that I was like, Oh, this is great. I want to do this. Amazing. And then just absolutely hammered it for the past five years. Oh, so you've been doing it five years. I was going to ask yeah. you. And like back in the day then, were you kind of, if you're saying like that kind of naive kind of confidence, were you like pre-writing stuff? Were you just getting up there and freestyling it kind of thing? When I started for that first year of running the shows at my uni, I pretty much just made it up on the spot. Bloody hell. Like I had a vague idea of like, this is a bit funny. Yeah. And then just went for it. And then, yeah, so that was for the first, I was like once a month for a year, I would do that at the uni. And then I started doing five minute sets. And my first set was like one liners, like puns, okay. which really isn't what I do now. Yeah. Um, and I I think that's interesting. Like it's 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 good to have that and be like you your first gig. I always quote this, and it's it's so this is how much of like a 
I'm a fake smart person. I quote things <laughs> that I've heard other people quote, but I don't know the references. Yeah. So it's a David Mamet quote that I heard Anthony Jeselnik say. Right. Uh, and uh, I do like David Mamet. He seems like an interesting guy. Uh, <laughs> but he, uh, he said that the process of becoming established as an artist is the process of closing a series of doors. So if you think on your first gig, you can do whatever you want. Right. Jimmy, there's a perfect example is Jimmy Carr on his first ever stand up gig had a guitar on stage. Okay. Didn't know that. Which obviously isn't what he does now. Right. And if he came out with a guitar, his audience would be like, what? It would yeah. be very jarring for them. So your first gig, you can do anything. But as people start to get to know you and you start to have an idea of what your style of comedy is, you just become increasingly boxed in. Okay. Um, by the parameters that you make in your own mind and the the audience that you perceive the audience to have of you. Yeah. Um. So it, my style kind of changed a lot, and I'm always trying to like break out of whatever people think I'm gonna do, quite a bit. Um. But yeah, when I started doing five minutes, I just had like this five minutes of it was very strange. It was one liners, but they all had the same punchline. Um, right. Okay. <laughs> did that for a while. Convinced myself like. As soon as I started being like the the comedian who was doing like the best on a gig of like the lineup of open micers, which is yeah. really like a low bar. Uh, I was like, why am I not getting on TV? Blah, blah, blah. And I only yeah. had like a bad seven minutes of stuff. <laughs> um, and then I managed to break out of that with some even weirder stuff about I was doing material about dolphins and all. Right. And then I think fairly quickly I learned lessons in what kind of my voice was and what kind of jokes i wanted to make but like i like that i tried weird stuff mm. first I, I like that i didn't feel wedded to sounding what i what people think a comedian sounds like or anything like that i've always tried to make it as close to my voice as possible which i think is a nice thing to do it's, it sounds like quite a brave thing to do that you're actually kind of a work in progress on stage and you're trying these different things well it? the thing is you can practice the guitar in your house and get rather yeah i swear on this is that bad if I swear do, on this? Do what you want, mate. Yeah, do what you yeah, want. Yeah, rather fucking good at the guitar by yourself. <laughs> okay. But stand up, you can practice it in the mirror in your bathroom as much as you want, but you don't know if it's funny. Mm, mm. And you won't know if it's funny uh, until you get up in front of an audience. So you're, you, you don't have to be bad at the guitar in front of people, but you have to be bad at comedy in front of people. Otherwise, you're not going to get good at it. God, it's, it's a brave thing to do. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is the kind of, I, I see comedy very much as kind of changing in terms of like the methods of discovery. So like cards on the table, I've never seen you play live, right? But I'm a fan because mm. I've seen the clips and stuff like that all over social. And you were getting mm. suggested to me, I go, who's this guy? I follow him. And I start to kind of follow the stuff that you do on social and stuff. So I'm wondering, do you think that's changed? You know, is that route into discovery changed at all in the last few years? Yeah, it's a completely different world than it was 10 years ago. Right. Um, Partly because almost nobody's watching TV in the okay. same way that they were 10 years ago. Like 10 years ago, if you did live at the Apollo, you could tour off the back of it to probably small theaters around okay. the UK. But now if you do live at the Apollo, you get a fairly decent paycheck. Right. But you don't, it doesn't build you an audience. Interesting. Whereas podcasts and clips online and Instagram and TikTok and all these things, that's where you build an audience and you connect with your audience on a much deeper level and a much more personal level, which has its downsides for sure. They get this kind of parasocial relationship where people think that they know you because they've listened okay. to your podcast and in a way they do, but you don't know them. So it's kind of a one-sided friendship that they've developed. Yeah. Um, which makes interacting with people sometimes difficult. Some people, uh, and it's understandable. Some people mistake where the where the boundaries are when you mm -hmm. have a podcasty audience. But I think the the perfect example of how much has changed is I had a podcast before I started stand up. Okay, yeah, which is just to older comedians is completely ludicrous. Uh, but again, it came from that thing of wanting to make things that I wanted to consume. So I was listening to a lot of podcasts. So yeah. I was like, well, I'll. I'll make one then because if I want to be a creator, then I should create the things that I would want to consume. That's kind of the the motto that I was living by and try to somewhat continue to live by. But yeah, I mean, I've not been on TV. I did right. the BBC New Comedian of the Year 2020, 
two, I think, uh-huh. um, got to the regional final right. and performed four and a half minutes of stand-up comedy on TV that very few people saw. Okay. Whereas I do one clip online where I'm making fun of a lady who has cancer in the front row in a nice it. way. It's yeah, a really hard it. thing to explain yep. to the listeners who haven't seen it. It's not nasty. <laughs> And that sells half my tour. I like honestly, that was I such a big see. boost for the tour. So it's just that thing of like, I think it's great. Some comedians bemoan it slightly, but there's always been a thing. There's always been a thing that you have to do. There's always been a way to make it in the industry. And maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago in stand up, every single comedian had to have a sitcom stri- script ready to go. That was like the thing that was like, you do your show at Edinburgh, you meet yep. TV producers, they get your sitcom idea, they make it, and that's you off to the races. But, I mean, I just, like, I wouldn't like that. But if I was around 15 years ago, I'd probably do it. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah, just yeah, the yeah, way, okay. whatever the way to making it work and to making a career out of it, that's what I'll do because I want to be a comedian. So clips and learning how to subtitle and learning how to make your own stuff and be a graphic designer and be a marketing expert on some level on how to market yourself like yeah it's necessary and for me like people always talk to me as if i've made some clever choice to do what i'm doing it really i think comes from a fear that when i started i didn't i didn't expect anything from anyone on on some level i was like no one's no one's going to want me. No one's going to give me anything. I'm not going to be handed anything by by some TV person. They're not just going to give me a career. So, right. And you even see people who get on, who got on all the panel shows for a year. They did everything in one year, and then they come out the other side with nothing Fuck, other okay. than a big fucking tax bill. <laughs> um, so comedians have seized the means of production, right? Doing yes, so. on some level, which is exciting. And people, I, I find it funny that people say that I'm very, very hardworking, uh, which I hate as well. I don't, I try not to lead with that. There mm. are comedians and there are artists who lead with how hardworking they are, but I don't okay. care how hardworking the artists I like are. It doesn't make a fuck of a difference to me if right. my favorite comedian works hard. I want the thing to be good. I want the art to be good. I want to enjoy what they're making. I don't want to see the cogs turning. I don't want to see the effort going into it. Yeah. Um, so it somewhat frustrates me when people say I'm hardworking, but it is a compliment. But I think the the truth of it is, is that I studied at a very high level music college as a classical musician. Right. And um, I wasn't a very hardworking classical musician. But even a lazy classical musician is an extremely hardworking stand-up comedian. <laughs> okay, fair enough. I wanted to ask you, the way you clip stuff up seems to be a lot of audience interaction, right? So mm. it's almost to me, and tell me if I'm wrong, that you're keeping the actual narrative-based stuff for your actual tour. So you're encouraging people to come, but you're actually giving something different away, the individual kind of spontaneous yeah. jokes. Yeah, that's how it works. Yeah, for sure, because... Uh to use another music analogy if you uh if you have have a band that you like and you like a particular song by that band when you go to the concert you want to hear that song yep but if you have a comedian and you see one of their jokes online and it makes you laugh when you go to the show you don't want to hear that joke because it's already happened jokes happen once and then they stop happening right um so Basically, if something goes really, really big online, then you can't or shouldn't, I don't think, do it in a in a tour show to the same audience who's already seen it because jokes are all about surprise yeah, and course. subverting expectations. And if they already know what's going to happen, the joke's dead, basically. Interesting. So you mentioned your podcast, right? So that's Mike and Vittorio's Guide to Parenting. And as far as I'm aware, I've listened to a few episodes, there is no guide to any parenting information in that podcast. No, no, literally none whatsoever. <laughs> Uh, it's very fun. We we just we thought well, this is a very stupid podcast, so it should ha- it should have a a fittingly stupid title. So, how long you been doing that? On some level, we started that in January, mm-hmm. um, and it's going really really well. We're really excited about it. We're doing our first live show at the Edinburgh Fringe on the fifth of August. Oh, that's wow. literally announced today, actually. So I Fantastic. don't know if this will be out in time, but 
Yes, that's on the 5th of August at 8.30 p.m. Um, Fantastic. And that's cool. So it's it's gone really, really well. I've had different iterations of my own podcast that have existed since for the past five going into six years. Yeah. But I kind of parked them finally and went, it's so much effort doing your own one. I'm sure you know this and yeah. finding guests and guests endlessly dropping out and having people coming around to fix their windows. So you have to delay <laughs> the podcast by an hour. And I'm very sorry about that. But <laughs> um. Yeah, Mike is such a wonderful person to work with, not least because he, I think he is actually insane. Right. Um, and he's a very, very easy person to do a podcast with. And it's really fun. It's just really silly. And it seems to resonate with people Yeah. Um, on lots of different levels. And it's just been great. You mentioned Edinburgh. So you've got your Edinburgh show coming up. It's your second yeah. time in Edinburgh, if I'm right. But you're doing the podcast up there as well. That's a busy old time. Yeah, well, just one, just one, a one-off podcast show. We might do a second one if it gets, um, if that one sells well. Uh, but I expect nothing. Um, wow. But yes, it is. It is my uh, difficult second album that I'm taking to the to the Edinburgh Fringe. I'm yeah. excited about it. Uh, people have been very lovely and and bought tickets. I'm I'm still always surprised when people buy tickets for stuff, even though. People go like I've said to people like, oh, the fringe is selling pretty well. Like that's cool, and they're like, yeah, yeah all your stuff sells well. And I go, well, I st it still still confuses me on some level. It still scares me on some level. Uh, di different points on my first tour that happened earlier this year, I, I convinced myself that we'd have to do a much smaller tour next year because surely okay. half of these people aren't going to come back again. Right next year, it was basically how, even though the gigs went well, I was like, oh no, there they'll have got their fill of me and won't want to see me again next year was what I'd kind of convinced myself of. I mean, you were nominated for best newcomer last year at Edinburgh, right? That's massive. I was. Yeah. Yeah. It was really cool. Um, I went up and took a bit of a risk in terms of, I didn't have any PR. I only right. just signed with an agent, but they weren't really involved in the show. I already had it all booked in. Um, and I just like no real industry backing, just like doing my own thing and trying to build it myself and again people bought tickets and came out and supported and other comedians were hugely helpful having me on their podcast like the have a word podcast i've yeah. always been super super supportive of me yeah and um yeah i went up and and i'm not one of those comedians that says that i didn't care about getting nominated i really wanted to get nominated for the award when i went up and it was yeah, fair play. a real goal of mine and and it was really exciting when i when i did get nominated and i think that has and um, people go, oh, geez, must must. Uh, somebody said to me, a comedian called Brennan Reese, who a few years ago was also nominated for Best Newcomer. Okay. He said to me on the day, he was like, congratulations, man. Uh, everyone's going to tell you your life's going to change for a year. And then it won't. And, I went, <laughs> <laughs> and it really made me laugh. And it really resonated. But because I still have that mindset of like, why would anyone give me anything i just still have that thing of like i'm just going to build it myself go straight to the people and i i hope that's a more sustainable way to to build a career so the new show is called who do you think you are i am can you tell mm. me think about the themes of it it starts when we talk in end of the month i think yeah it starts the 31st of july is the first show up in wow. edinburgh I've, I've previewed it a whole bunch of times it's got a very silly title that i do explain during the show it's based on a, a viral bowling video that i like <laughs> Uh, which is very stupid uh, <laughs> but uh it's sort of uh quite an introspective show i always find it hard to describe comedy shows without them sounding not funny i think funny is like that's that goes without saying the show's funny i've worked really hard to make it funny yeah but the the more narrative and the structure of it is that uh i don't know I'm trying to find a sense of who I am and uh, by extension, how I come across to other people Okay, and trying to attack that from different angles over the course of an hour. Nice. I like that. You're giving something away about yourself. It's come a long way since the one line of puns kind of thing. Mm, for sure. Nice, nice, mate. Nice. So you're going to be taking that on tour afterwards like you did last yes, year? Yes. So you? that'll be on tour in spring 2024. And actually the last, the the previous show translations, my award nominated show, <laughs> that will be, um, that will be released on 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 YouTube. I think in September we filmed it in May there and um, fantastic. Spent a lot of money on cameras. So please watch <laughs> it. <laughs> we'll get some retweets out there. I look forward to that, mate. And I will definitely come and see you on tour when that's touring. Oh, please do.
Coming up, Vittorio shares his football kit memories. So, mate, look, we're here to talk about football, and you've very kindly chosen three football shirts to talk about mm. today. So, the first shirt you've chosen is the Liverpool Champions League final shirt from 2005 by Reebok. Talk to me about this one. So, this is an interesting thing, and I'm always so nervous to say this on podcasts because I'm a fairly uh, public Celtic fan. Yeah, I see. Um, yeah, fairly openly, and that's like the the team that I'm really, really into, and I I've been to games of, and and will go to games of, and have lots of shirts of, and all of that stuff. Mm. But when I was a kid, I was a Liverpool fan, okay. and, and I always find that a bit strange. I think I get really, really jealous of people who come from families where their dad supported a team and took right. them to the game, and. Right like really instilled that sense of like this, our family supports this. Yeah. Whereas I supported Liverpool because we went to this like after school daycare and one of the staff there called Liam was like really cool. Okay. And we all thought he was really cool and he supported Liverpool. Right. So I was like, well, I'll, I'll do that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 And then kind of got into it, but you never have that real connection and personal connection to it because you know, it's just a kind of, it's on a whim, really. You don't get into it that much. And we were never a Sky Sports household because, again, my parents didn't care about football. So they like, right. were like, if my dad, my dad didn't, he was like, I'm not going to spend that much money on something that I don't want to watch. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Course. So, yeah, yeah. so we never really had that. I, ne- I never really got to watch the games that much, but I was a Liverpool fan and I got shirts and I was excited about it. And, mm. and I remember, uh, crying and going to bed at half time at Istanbul. No way. Yeah. And then, how old were you at the time? Nine. Nine. Okay. Right. Oh, okay. eight. eight. I turned nine the next day. Okay. Wow. Yeah. It was twenty fifth wow. of May, uh, two thousand and five, and I was uh, my birthday is the twenty sixth. Right. Um, and it really annoys me. The twenty fifth of May is such a good date mm-hmm. historically. Twenty fifth of May is when Celtic won the European cup in 1967 of course it's yeah. when liverpool won in istanbul it's when muhammad ali knocked out sonny liston first wow. minute of the first round uh-huh. um, and the 26th of may is jeremy corbyn's birthday and that's <laughs> it that's the whole thing but uh yeah 25th of may i remember crying and going to bed in istanbul and then being like dragged out of bed by my dad who d- didn't care about football but knew that this was oh. a fairly important game one of the best games in history yeah dragged me back up to watch it but again, it was hard. I kind of fell out of being into football as much just because I saw other people and I was like, I just don't have that connection to it. And also when you when you can't watch it, when you'd either have to like illegally stream it, but it was kind of before that was available, yeah, like yeah. Uh, in the same way and or it'd have to go around to a friend's house and it wasn't always an option. It's just hard to really get into a team. Sure, sure. So I kind of fell out of football going into like my mid to late teens. Mm-hmm. And then I moved to London when I was 18. And this links into the next shirt. Perfect segue. Very yeah. nice. Yeah, so, which is... Go, 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 go. Well, look, this is... You tell me, mate. This is shirt number two. It's a fake Scott Brown shirt that you bought in Mumbai. Yeah, I love fake football shirts. Okay. I don't know why. I just think they're so funny. Yeah. Uh, Like, I like the little wrongness on them. Just right. something about, like, that little... Oh, oh. And I think it might come from... I nearly convinced my dad to buy me a fake Barcelona top when, when I was like maybe six in yeah, Spain. Okay. Yeah. And um, I was always weird about money when I was a kid. I was always stressed that things were too expensive. Like we were fine for money. Like I come from a pretty middle class background. Yeah. But every time we would like go to buy clothes or something, it was always my mom going, no, no, like you can spend oh. money if you want it. <laughs> and we were in this like market in Spain and there was like, I can't remember who it wouldn't have been. Sandy Cazorla never played for Barcelona, did he? Oh, I don't think so. Villarreal, he was at, wasn't he? I think. Yeah. Anyway, it was some, I can't remember who, but some kind of like not main Barcelona player on the back of this shirt. And I remember just Mm. seeing it and just liking it. 
and then talking to my dad and my dad going, oh, we can probably get it if you want. You know, it's 25 euro or whatever. Yeah. And I remember just as we were about to buy it, I was like, no, no, it's too much. And then started crying and like ran away from the market. <laughs> So that was, I think that I'm what trying to. What kind of a kid I'm, does that? It's a kid I, I, I want, I want, I want. No, I was such a weird kid, man. <laughs> uh, but I, I think my obsession with fake football shirts is probably me trying to buy that Barcelona top. Yeah. Um, and it would be a really funny fake shirt if it had Cazorla on the back of it, because that wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so I, I, I buy fake football shirts most places that I go. In right. the world that have little markets, like I bought a fake grease top in Corfu recently because I thought that was funny. Nice. And I bought, I thought the funniest one was this Scott Brown top that I bought in uh, Mumbai just because I thought, I think that was the first Celtic shirt that I owned. Really? Um, was a fake Scott Brown. How fake we talk it? F- uh, it looked like n- no year. Okay. Like there's no year that it looked like my friend, I, I wore it in front of my friend Francesco and he's like obsessive about like kits and a big Celtic fan. Yeah. And he was like, that is a mix of the 2008, 2011 oh, wow. and 2012 okay. shirts. What? And it's, <laughs> it's got elements of all of them and it's freaking me out. Right okay. <laughs> um, so I bought that and Cesco is a good, uh, example of how i got into celtic like you're kind of by default a celtic fan or a rangers fan in belfast like it's just like sure part of as well as whoever your premier league team is it's like yeah i like celtic yeah I like rangers whatever just because of the divide yeah but um uh, uh it's hard to do it like outwardly you kind of don't want to wear them out and about it's kind of a statement that you don't okay. want to make in, in public and all those things yeah. i remember my younger cousin came to visit and his dad's from Glasgow and he grew up in England uh-huh. and he came downstairs and we were going to the park. He came downstairs in a Celtic top and we were like, Hey man, you can't wear that. <laughs> and he was like, why? And we were like, you just can't. <laughs> so he went upstairs, came back down and something different. We went to the park and he, he just put a hoodie on top of the Celtic top and took off his hoodie in the park. And we were like, no, oh. <laughs> and like, I mean, the nine times out of ten, you're grand, but you just yeah. don't want to like take that chance. But right. the thing is, because of that, but then I landed in London, and London's quite like a lonely city. It's quite a difficult place to find a sense of community. And I I started at uni, and um, a lot of English people just thought of me like as the Irish guy. They would just make fun of my accent and they would do this, that and the other. And it was okay. it was playful and it was well-intentioned, but it was kind of frustrating to not just be able to relax and be a person. But then I found that like there was a group of kind of slightly insane Glaswegians right. who were at the unis and like neighboring slash like sister unis or like similar unis in London. Mm-hmm. And I became friends with them and they were just like, oh man, do you want to go watch the Celtic game? And I was like, yeah. Mm-hmm. And... I really find so like it was such an important thing to me, that sense of community while trying to find my way in London. Right. That I think that finally gave me like a proper connection to a football club in a way that I hadn't had before. So I came, I became more of a, an active Celtic fan right. after moving to London. Interesting. And would you wear your Scott Brown shirt with pride now around town? Yeah. I mean, in London, it's fun. You just get like, a lot of thumbs up mostly from homeless people which is sad like they're always delighted to see a Celtic top most of the time you see a Celtic top in London it is a homeless man and I find that a little bit disheartening I mean there's probably deep cultural historical psychological yeah, for sure. we... <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ wow okay that's nice uh, and also quite scary let's move on to your mm. third shirt so this is the uh i think it was called the italy renaissance shirt from the 2020 euros that are obviously played in 2021 mm. by puma this is green one tell, tell me about this one mate well i mean what what better shirt for a half italian half irish mm. boy than a green italy top yeah. what an absolute joy for me to have that available yeah. to me especially during the tournament where I went to see the most live football matches that I've ever seen. Oh, nice. You got down to so some I, games. I went to three of the Euros games at Wembley. I went to wow. see Italy versus Austria uh-huh. in the last 16. I went to see Italy versus Spain in the semi final, and I went to see Italy versus England in the final. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And I'm guessing you would have been an Italy supporter in that scenario. 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I I remember having these funny little interviews on because not very many comedians were being uh, admitting to being Italy fans in the lead up to the final. Interesting. And uh, yeah, I know what a surprise. <laughs> and uh, I went on Radio Five Live, and the guy said to me, "So you're half Irish, half Italian? Are you conflicted over who to support in the match?" <laughs> No, went, no. <laughs> half of me wants Italy to win, the other half wants England to lose. We're all on the same page. Um, but it was just so exciting to tap back into that kind of again. Like I am, there are Italian bits to me. Like I have a, like a nonno and a nonna, and it was really yeah. nice to share that with them. I went back and they had like Italy flags up all around the house and nice feeling part of that and people thought i was kind of bandwagoning but um i managed to unearth a, a picture of me as a very small child in like full italy kit and just being yeah, all man. excited and i did a whole project about like buffon when i was in primary school because i was a goalkeeper and he I was, uh, was like, cool and all that stuff and we, i remember uh we loved it uh in our house because my younger brother is called alessandro Okay. So we had Del Piero and Nesta at one point, both like in the team. And we were like, this is so cool. That, nice. like, that's his name as well. Nice. Um, so it was just so exciting uh, to really get behind a team and to be able to spend 10 pounds on travel to get to see yeah. the team you're supporting in a European competition is just ludicrous it's so rare that you get to do that and as much as everybody was like shitting money on tickets for the final yeah i was just already registered as an italy fan on the uefa oh, website wow okay so i just got the first release of the the italy section yeah so i i paid like it was 200 quid but it, do you know what i mean like worth it though, right thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds so i just got actual face value tickets for the final but to see like, them win as well that's incredible oh that's so worth unbelievable. it unbelievable yeah just absolutely crazy and i talk about the the experience of going to those different games in the new the new show actually nice, but nice and the italy versus spain game i was at the corner beside where the penalties happened okay and it was just i just couldn't believe that i was there it was completely <laughs> surreal that i got to see that in the way that i saw it it was just it didn't really make any sense to me and what like i thought that italy team were really really cool it was yeah it was one of those rare occasions where you it wasn't it wasn't the same way in 2006 where italy kind of boring their way to the world cup but like it was just a lot of incredible defense yeah and steadfastness old hardy italian players with a little bit of flair up front with like del piero came off the bench and that mm -hmm. stuff but i mean when your striker is like luca tony you're not exactly a flair <laughs> team so it, it wasn't that what i loved about the euros is that italy played a really positive attacking brand of football the whole way yeah, through yeah. but it was an attacking brand of football where if we had a star player it was one of our center backs or goalkeeper. Like yeah. those were the real kind of um like names on yeah. the team. So I just thought it was such a cool team to get behind. Not boring, exciting football. And yeah, I just I just love it being able to tap into that kind of side of myself. I love the fact that they still retained the Italian defense tradition, that kind of grab it's, was it Chiellini that grabbed Saka? Pulling down oh yeah ground. anybody who was annoyed about that is insane oh, yeah. and has never watched football before ever <laughs> again like, it's just so it's just such good defending yep in that moment when you're a what 40 year old Kalini <laughs> against an absolutely rapid saka yeah of course that's what you do and you do it early so it is a yellow card Correct. not a red card it's a brilliant piece of defending and i loved all the people who were on the bandwagon going this is so terrible shut, <laughs> up. shut up and go back to watching bake off you idiots <laughs> age old italian tradition we probably alienated plenty of england <laughs> listeners to the podcast i'm a scotland fan so i'm totally in your boat mate good well, look, mate, that's three amazing shirts. Thanks so much for sharing your football kit memories with me. Um, you've got the Edinburgh show coming up at the end of uh, July, you mentioned, and you've got the tour coming early next year, you said. Yeah, so that, I think that'll, that'll go on sale in September sometime, in and around when the when the special comes out. 
lovely stuff well. so those are the main three things and the podcast mike and vittorio's guide to parenting wonderful stuff well mate it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you thanks so much for doing the podcast thanks very much for having me so there you have it massive thanks to vittorio for sharing his football kit memories with me you can follow me on instagram or get in touch via twitter or email you can find out more about Vittorio's Edinburgh show, his tour and his podcast on his website. That's vittorioangelone.com. Make sure you follow him on all the socials too. The music you heard was produced by Evil Ed. You can check out his music on his Bandcamp page. There's links to absolutely everything I mentioned there in the notes section of the podcast too. And finally, thanks to you for listening. If you have enjoyed it, please do spread the word. Give me a follow on social. Get on Apple, get on Spotify, wherever you listen and write me a review, which can really help the podcast grow. Remember that sharing is caring. And other than that, I guess that's it. So until next time with my next guest, whoever that might be, whenever that might be, I'll catch you soon. Take care. <laughs>